slides. It won't be too bad, I promise. Um, this is one of the theory slides, and it's really about letting you know what pH is, and when you're measuring pH, what you're doing. Um, when you're measuring pH, what you're actually doing is measuring hydrogen ions. So the reason it's a little lowercase p, capital H, is because originally that was um, a, a reference to the power of hydrogen. Um, you know, essentially you're measuring hydrogen ions in your sample, in your, in your water, in whatever sample, whatever industry, you're measuring hydrogen ions. And the other important takeaway is that it's a logarithmic scale. So it's a factor of 10. Uh, a log is a factor of 10. So as we'll see on the pH scale, even though we might be talking about a unit or two in terms of pH, it's a big deal in terms of how acid or how basic that sample is. So pH is the negative log of the hydrogen ion activity. Now you know. So what is pH and what does the pH scale look like? Um, we're measuring hydrogen, as I just mentioned. And so if we think of pH first in terms of water around room temperature, um, pure water around room temperature has a pH of 7. And water, as you know, is H2O, right? So um, water, H2O, has hydrogen ions, and it also has hydroxide ions, um, the H2O part of it. So when that um, sort of breaks apart in a solution, um, what you're doing when you're measuring pH is, again, measuring the, the free hydrogen, the number of hydrogen ions that you have in that sample. So the more hydrogen that you have, the more hydrogen ions, the more free hydrogen that you have, the more acidic a sample is. So this would be an example where you have a ton of hydrogen ions and very little hydroxide ions. On the other side, if you have more hydroxide ions and very few hydrogen ions, then you've got something that's really more on the basic side of the scale. Um, I think this is probably a little bit easier to understand. So the scale is from 0 to 14. As I said, 7 is neutral. Anything below 7 is on the acid side. Anything above 7 is on the basic side of the scale. Um, and as I mentioned on the first slide, every pH unit is a factor of 10, right? So if you've got something that's at a pH of, um, of uh, 2.5, in the case of like Coca-Cola, and you've got something else that's at a pH of 3.5, like orange juice, um, it's one pH unit, but that's a factor of 10. So Coke is 10 times more acidic than orange juice. So think of it also in terms of, uh, like you've got Coke at 2.5, and you've got water at 7. So from 7 to 6, it's a factor of 10. From 6 to 5, now it's 10 times 10, so that's 100 times more acid. Um, from 5 to 4, it's another factor of 10, so that's 10,000, I'm sorry, 1,000 times more acid. So at a pH of 2.5, you're actually about 50,000 times more acidic than Coke. So Coke is, is a pretty acidic thing. Um, the other good example is beer. Um, Coke compared to beer. So beer is at 4.5, Coke is at 2.5, so Coke is about 100 times more acidic than beer. Um, so the message is, drink less Coke, drink more beer. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's the scale. Um, the important thing is that every factor is a pH of 10, or every uh, pH unit is a factor of 10. And so when you're um, thinking about pH and you're writing down your pH readings in your logbook or, or whatever, you're thinking to yourself, oh, this is a pH of 8.1 or 8.2, big deal. But it is a big deal in terms of how acid or how basic that, uh, that water is or that sample is. All right, a little bit about um, how it all works in the pH measurement system. So there are a few parts uh, to the system when you're measuring pH. The first part is the pH meter, right? You can't do it without a pH meter. Um, the pH meter is nothing more than a voltmeter. I'm sure a lot of you have used a voltmeter at home or, or um, you know, at school. Um, a pH electrode generates a very small voltage measured in millivolts, so one one thousandth of a volt. Um, and that is what the meter is picking up and taking that millivoltage and translating it to a pH reading. So all the meter is is, is a glorified voltmeter. The um, parts down here, the, the electrodes, I know a lot of you have a single pH electrode, right? It's called a combination electrode. But when electrodes first came out, they actually were available only as a set, a sensing electrode and a reference electrode. The electrodes that you're using today are all in one. They're called combination. It has the reference and the pH part built in. We still sell the separate electrodes. Some customers still love to use the separate reference, separate pH electrode. But uh, I bet most of you have the combination. So what's happening on the pH side, at the very bottom, there's a glass ball. And that glass ball in that pH electrode is looking for those hydrogen ions that we talked about. So think of this um, solution here. 
is now this uh, illustration over here. So in that wastewater sample, or the water sample, or that coke sample, whatever, you're looking for those hydrogen ions, that pH ball on the electrode has a solution inside of it at a known pH, at about a pH of 7. So what happens when you put the electrode into a sample, depending upon how many hydrogen ions you have on the outside in the sample, and what you have on the inside, there's going to be a difference of hydrogen ion or a difference in concentration of that hydrogen. And that's going to cause that potential to develop, that voltage to develop. So if you were to place the electrode into a pH 7 buffer, what's inside of the electrode is 7, what you're putting it into is a 7, no voltage. So it'll be about 0, 0 millivolts. The farther away you are from 7, the greater that voltage will be. So that's what the pH electrode does. It generates a voltage based on the hydrogen ions that you're measuring. On the other side, there's a reference electrode. And the job of the reference electrode is to, regardless of the sample that you put it into, could be that beer, could be that uh, coffee, could be that coke, that, that water sample, if you put this electrode into whatever, it will have the same voltage, regardless. So the job of the reference electrode is to maintain that stable voltage. And so what the meter does, in this case, is compare a changing voltage on the pH side versus a stable voltage on the reference side. It comes up with a difference. It just literally subtracts one from the other, comes up with that difference, and that it translates into the pH reading. Most of the problems that I see with pH are a result of the reference, not the pH. So the reference part, um, either the material inside has gone old and, you know, no longer provides a reference, or more likely, the channel that exists in that reference electrode that makes contact with the sample, that area is called the junction. A lot of times, that junction will clog, and it doesn't allow the fill solution that's inside of this reference electrode to flow out. So that's the last piece. The way this um, circuit is completed is by having a liquid come out of that reference electrode, or if you have a gel electrode, it's the ions in that gel, all electrodes, all pH electrodes leak. So as that leakage occurs, it completes the circuit between the reference side and the pH side. If that junction area clogs, you break the circuit and you have all sorts of problems. Or if it's partially clogged, that's when you get into these slow, drippy, bouncy readings. So junctions account for 80% of electrode, pH electrode problems. So it's important to, to have an electrode that has the right junction uh, for the kinds of samples that, that you measure. Any questions? I know there's a lot on that slide before we, we go on. Okay. So the pH measurement system, the pH meter, um, again, all it is is a glorified voltmeter. It's got a lot of bells and whistles to it. It's got the ability to store calibrations, temperature compensate. You can plug it into a printer. You can plug it into a computer. Uh, it adjusts for slope automatically. So there are a lot of features to the pH meter. But at the heart of it, again, it's nothing more than a voltmeter. Um, we talked about reference electrodes, we talked about pH electrodes. I want to talk about the different kinds of references because that's really how you select an electrode for the kind of sample that you're measuring. So um, I know um, most of you are, are measuring wastewater samples. Do any of you do clean water as well? So some clean water, some, some wastewater? Okay. Uh, so once upon a time, when electrodes first came out, the, the most common type of reference used was called a calomel. I think what a lot of customers didn't realize is that a calomel reference is mercury-based. So if you have a calomel electrode, just know that inside there's mercury. If you break that electrode, it's a mercury spill. Um, it's an electrode you really can't just toss in the trash. So just be aware of that. Most manufacturers have stopped making calomel electrodes. We did a few years ago. Some still do, so just kind of be aware that if you're buying a calomel electrode, there's mercury inside. Um, it has some advantages and disadvantages, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because they're pretty hard to find anymore. The most common type of um, reference electrode or reference in an electrode is silver. And it's usually uh, referred to as silver, silver chloride. So what it is, it's, it's silver inside that electrode. It's hard to see um, on this image, but at the very bottom here, this is a silver wire. At the very bottom here is a little blob of silver. That is the reference of the electrode, and that's what maintains the stable voltage. Um, what you fill the electrode with, this is a combination electrode, by the way. What you fill it with is KCL that has silver in it to keep that silver plated on the wire. 
And then that comes out through the very bottom area through that junction that we talked about. So this is an example of a silver-based reference electrode or a silver-containing combination electrode. It works well for most samples. The problem is if you're um, working with a clean water sample, that silver tends to precipitate and that junction clogs, so that electrode doesn't work too well. Um, or if you're working at different temperatures, that electrode will take minutes to stabilize. It, it has a lag as a hysteresis. Or in wastewater sample, if you have um, sulfides in there, um, that silver will precipitate with the sulfide and clog that electrode. So there are some things where a silver electrode really is not the best choice. And there you want to go to something called a double junction silver electrode. And there's another option also. But with a double junction electrode, you keep that silver inside the probe. So in this case, that kind of blue coil, if you can see it, um, that's where the silver is. Then there's a little barrier there, and then there's KCL that comes out. So the whole idea with a double junction is that you keep the silver in, and you just let the salt come out. And so you don't have a lot of the clogging issues that you do with a single junction electrode. So for, for your water samples, for your wastewater samples, I would definitely recommend, at the very least, a double junction reference in your electrode. It'll make a big difference. Um, pretty good um, uh, response from the electrode. Repeatability is plus or minus 0.02. You can get these as a refillable electrode or as a, a gel-filled electrode. And um, the only disadvantage is that temperature. So if you're working with a cold sample, let's say, if you calibrate a room temperature and you stick that in a cold water sample, it's still going to take a while for that electrode to stabilize. So the other option that's available is called the Ross electrode. And the Ross electrode has a reference inside that's made out of iodine. So it's not a metal, it's a liquid. And that iodine responds very quickly to different temperatures. Um, the iodine gives you great repeatability, plus or minus 0.01, uh, very fast response, 30 seconds regardless of the temperature, and then it is a double junction design, so you don't have any, any drifting, any clogging with that electrode. Um, the only real disadvantage is that it's a more expensive electrode, and in this case you really kind of do get what you pay for. If you want a really fast electrode that's stable, not going to drift, that's going to be fast at you know, whatever temperature, a rust electrode is going to work for you very well. But it's about twice as expensive as a kind of a standard electrode. Uh, but it, it works very well. So those are the different types of, of references. Um, Calomel, single junction silver, double junction silver, and then Ross. Um, on the other side, we, we talked about the junction of the electrode being a very important area that can clog over time. And so there are three common types of junctions that um, I'll talk about. The first kind is called wick. <laughs> The second kind is called ceramic, and the last kind is called the liquid junction. So the first kind, the wick junction, usually you find these in plastic body electrodes, epoxy probes. And these electrodes have um, some kind of wick. Really hard to see from back there, I'm sure, but this is a little rectangle uh, material here. That's a piece of Dacron that's inside the electrode that juts out through the bottom. That is the junction of the electrode. Sometimes these can be made out of glass um, fiber bundles, different materials, but essentially it's, it's a wick, and that fill solution inside that electrode um, leaks out through that, wick, through that wick out into the sample. So it works well for most uh, water samples, but if you are working in um, like a sludge sample or a, a wastewater sample, uh, an influence sample, um, that electrode, that junction will clog pretty easily. And as that clogs, you start to get a slower and slower and slower response, and that electrode will drift and drift and drift. So just kind of keep that in mind. Also, a wick junction is not as, it's not as fast, generally speaking, as other kinds of junctions. The, the most common type of junction is called a ceramic junction. And that's, that's what it is. It's a piece of ceramic. It's a little piece of ceramic, and the KCL, that fill solution, comes out through the pores of that ceramic. So on this electrode, if you can see that little white circle there, that is the ceramic. And so this is a little bit faster than wick, but still likely to clog if you're putting it into a, a kind of a dirty sample. Um, so just keep that in mind. The other thing about um, junctions, whether it's wick or whether it's ceramic, is that you can tell if it's getting clogged not only by the speed of response, but also by the color of the junction. When you get a brand new electrode, it has a brand new junction, it's going to be white. 
And as that starts to clog, as it starts to um, age, that junction is going to turn dark on you. So if you see the very bottom of the electrode, if you look at it closely, you look where the junction is. If that's uh, kind of a black color, um, that's a problem. That electrode is clogged or partially clogged. It's not going to give you very good results. So that is a ceramic junction usually found on, um, on glass probes. The last type of junction is called a liquid junction. And with a liquid junction, you have no material that can clog. It's basically the liquid inside making direct contact with your sample outside. Um, in this case, this is the, uh, the body of the electrode uh, making contact with sort of the inner body. And this is an example of a flushable liquid junction electrode. So it's like a pen. You hit the cap on that electrode, it pulls the bottom apart, and it drains out. So there's no junction to clog. This is an electrode that you cannot clog. So you can put it into any, any kind of sample, and it's not going to clog, it's easy to clean, and it's super fast because you've got a pretty big flow of that salt solution coming out of the electrode. So it's got a lot of advantages. The only disadvantage is that it has a, a pretty high flow. Where other electrodes leak just a few drops a day, this electrode leaks about two mils per day. So it's got a, a pretty high flow of that KCL. But that KCL is pretty cheap, and it gives you an electrode that's not going to clog and is very fast. So definitely for wastewater, if you want a really good probe, um, a, a sure flow, we call it a sure flow, or a liquid junction electrode is, is a really good way to go. So other things to consider, we talked about references, we talked about junctions. The next thing to think about is, do I want a refillable probe, or do I want a um, gel-filled probe? So if you've got a gel electrode, um, you've got something that's low maintenance, right? You don't have to worry about fill solution. It's sealed. Um, it comes in, a, in usually in a very rugged plastic epoxy body. Uh, but the repeatability, or the precision, is not as good as on a refillable electrode. So usually 0.05 to 0.1. So if you want an electrode that you can use to report, readings, you know, this uh, may not be the best choice. It's great for rugged use, it's great for field use, good for uh, <coughs> kind of ballpark pH reading, but if you want something reliable to the 100th of pH, this is probably not the kind of probe that you want to get. Um, also, because it's sealed, you can't refill it, and because you can't refill it, it has a long, uh, it has a shorter life than a refillable. So I've known customers that have had a gel probe for years, and they swear by it, they swear it's working, but the average life is about six months if you're using that probe every day. Um, because that, that, the ions in that gel come out of the electrode. It's consumed and you can't refill it. Um, refillable electrodes, you have to remember to fill them, you have to remember to drain them, you have to remember to take care of them. But um, you can get a much better precision, much faster response, and a much longer life. <coughs> The guarantee on a gel electrode is three months. The guarantee that we give on a refillable electrode is one to two years, depending on the model. So a much better life, and um, we do that just by replacing that fill solution. There is a compromise. Um, like most things in life, you can, you can get something that's kind of a, uh, a hybrid. So there is this electrode that's called a polymer electrode. And a polymer is kind of a high-performance gel. So a polymer electrode is more expensive than a gel, not quite as expensive as a um, refillable electrode, but it is low maintenance, it's sealed, and you get much better precision. So if you want something that's low maintenance, it gives you pretty good response, a uh, polymer-based electrode, um, you know, the polymer would be the, um, the, the material inside the electrode, that would be a, a good choice for you. And these are double junctions, so it would find in water or wastewater samples. So how do you choose an electrode? Um, you know, we talked about references, we talked about junctions, we talked about bodies. Um, you know, think about the reference that makes sense. I think for a lot of you, if you're working at different temperatures, a Ross reference is a good choice, or at the very least, a double junction, silver electrode. Think about the junction. If you're always working in clean samples, then a ceramic junction is just fine. If you are working in a wastewater <coughs> sample, an influence sample, then a sure flow, uh, flushable electrode is a much better way to go. Um, you can get electrodes that are smaller, larger, um, taller, uh, a lot of different shapes and sizes. You can get electrodes that have temperature built in. They're called three-in-one electrodes or triodes. Um, that's the other consideration. So all these things are things that uh, um, are available. And if you think of an electrode that has a certain type of reference, a certain type of junction, a certain top type of body style, that electrode probably exists out there. There are hundreds and hundreds of different styles of electrodes, but the, 
This is how uh, you kind of select an electrode for what you're doing. With. <coughs> Any questions before I go on to my other theory slide here? Everybody sticking with me? There's going to be a quiz at the end, so ask questions now. And you guys at the very back, you're going to be the ones that are going to get the, uh, the questions asked. I'm kidding. All right. Um, so the Nernst equation. The Nernst equation is what um, sort of governs calibrations for, for pH. So the Nernst equation is this up here. And all it really is, is what we've talked about already. We've talked about measuring hydrogen ions, right? we talked about the fact that it's a logarithmic scale. we talked about the fact that there's a reference electrode, and that reference electrode should have a very stable voltage. That's that E0. That's the reference potential. We're measuring a, a, a voltage from the electrode. The rest of it are constants um, that are, are right here. So what, what happens when you solve this, what it's basically saying is that when you're calibrating with your pH electrode, the slope that you should get from that electrode at 25 degrees Celsius is 59.16 or 59.2 millivolts for every pH unit. So if you plot it out and you have millivolts on one side of the scale, pH on the other side of the scale, for every change in pH units, so here we're going from a pH 7 to a pH of 8, the change in millivolts is about 59.2, in theory, for a perfect electrode. And so what you're doing when you're calibrating, you're comparing your response, the response of your electrode, against this 59.2 perfect theoretical slope. And that's what the meter does for you. So most of your meters, I'm sure, give you a slope after you calibrate. 98%, 99%, 92%, whatever. What the meter is doing internally is looking at the millivolt values for those buffers. So let's say you take your electrode, you put it into a pH 7 buffer. That pH 7 buffer on the millivolt scale, if you switch your meter to the millivolt scale, um, is reading negative 10, let's say. It should be pretty close to zero. If you I'm going to take this out, just um, making noise here. <coughs> So if you put your electrode into a 4 buffer, in this case it's reading 150 millivolts. So the difference between the two, from a positive 150 to a negative 10, is 160. So that, let's say for your electrode, is what you see as a difference between a pH 4 and a pH 7 buffer. Now, we know that in, in theory it should be 59.2 for every pH unit. So if you take 59.2, we're going over three pH units, that works out to 177.6. So 177.6 would be a perfect slope. You're getting a, a value of 160, so you take 160 divided by 177.6, and that works out to be 90%. So that's what your meter's doing inside. Um, that's how it's calculating slope. It's looking at the difference in millivolts for your electrode and comparing it to a perfect electrode based on that Nernst equation. We'll see what the slope ranges should be in a little bit, but um, slopes is the single best indicator of when you need to replace that electrode or when you need to clean that electrode. Um, so how often do you calibrate? What are some of the guidelines? Um, some hints. Always calibrate with at least two buffers. You don't know what the slope of the line is if you just do a one-point calibration. So you need two points to come up with, with a slope. So always do at least a two-point calibration. And always bracket with your buffers what you expect to measure. So if you're measuring between 4 and 7, calibrate with a 4 and 7. If you're measuring between 7 and 10, calibrate with a 7 and 10. If you're on both sides of 7, calibrate with a 4, a 7, and a 10. Do a three-point calibration. Um, in theory, it should be a straight line from 0 to 14. In practice, it's only linear over three pH units. So we don't recommend that you calibrate with a 4 and a 10, let's say. Calibrate with buffers that are no more than three pH units apart, and that bracket, what you expect to measure. Keep track of your slope every day. Keep a logbook. I'm sure you do already. Again, that's a really good indicator. You start to see that slope drop and drop and drop and drop. That's a good indicator of when you need to clean that electrode. And then how often to calibrate really depends on um, how many samples you do and how accurate you need that reading to be. The rule of thumb is to calibrate once a day. 
um, you know, some customers do hundreds of samples and maybe calibrating a couple times throughout the day is, uh, is a good idea. So it, it really depends on your sample and how many samples you do. And also the, the electrode that you're using. A Ross electrode will hold the calibration much better than a gel electrode. So the ideal slope range that you should see is 95% to 102%. If you're within that range, you're good. As you start to drop below 95%, that's when you want to clean the electrode, and that's when you start to have some problems. We'll talk more about uh, how to clean the electrodes in, in just a little bit. Um, so the other thing to talk about with regards to pH is temperature. Um, temperature actually has a pretty big effect on the whole thing. It affects the calibration. Temperature affects your buffers. Temperature affects the sample. Temperature also affects the electrodes. It actually affects four different things, and we'll talk about each one of these. Um, if you're calibrating and you're measuring at the same temperature, you don't have to worry about temperature compensating. But if you're calibrating at one temperature and measuring at a different temperature, then you really should temperature compensate. And you can do that with an automatic temperature compensator or ATC, a separate one that sits next to the pH electrode, or one that's built into the probe, one of those three-in-one probes that I talked about. Um, or there's a special kind of meter that you can get that uses any pH electrode. But the message is if you are working, if, you're, if your buffers are at a different temperature than your sample, then you really do need to temperature compensate. So the first effect is the effect that the temperature has on the electrode. And remember when I was talking about references, I said a silver electrode can take minutes to, to stabilize. That's kind of what this uh, little graph here is showing. So this is showing a, um, a change in temperature, and there's a change in pH as a result of that temperature. This gray line is showing you what, in theory, that change should look like. The blue line is showing you a silver-based electrode that kind of overshoots the right pH, and then takes minutes. You know, after about five minutes, it, it's coming back down. Um, the red line is showing you a Ross electrode and how quickly that stabilizes. So again, if you're at different temperatures, kind of going back and forth, a Ross electrode um, takes into account the impact that temperature has on the electrode very, very well. It stabilizes very quickly. The second effect that temperature has is on the calibration. And I said the slope should be 59.2 at 25. Well, guess what? At different temperatures, that slope number changes. So the meter needs to know what, this, what the temperature is so that it can adjust the slope of your calibration. So, um, in this case, it's showing you different slopes at different temperatures. Um, all of the, those lines intersect at one point. Uh, that point is called the ISO point or the ISO potential point. Some meters, you may have seen in your meter, will ask you what is the ISO point. Um, some meters will have you enter that number. Uh, for, for most electrodes, it's seven. That's the point at which temperature really doesn't have an effect on pH. That's the point around which the calibration, the slope is um, shifted or, or pivoted around. Um, a lot of you who have been using pH meters for a while, if you remember you had to start your calibration with a pH 7 buffer first, that's because the meter used that point to pivot the calibration to adjust for temperature. The newer meters don't care. You can start with a 7 first or a 4 first or a 10 first. It, it doesn't really care because it, it asks you this point or it knows this point ahead of time. So anyways, Make sure that you're taking temperature into account so the meter can adjust for the um, calibration. So that's the electrode, the calibration. The third effect is on the buffers. So your pH buffers have different pH values at different temperatures, especially the 10 buffer. So your 10 buffer is 10.01 at 25 degrees C. Let's say you store your pH buffer in a refrigerator and you take that out and your buffer is more like 20 degrees. Um, 20 degrees, a 10 buffer is actually 10.06. So if you're automatically calibrating and your meter is reading the temperature and you're calibrating with a 10 and your buffer is at uh, 20 degrees, it's going to want to calibrate to 10.06. Don't override that. Don't say, no, this is a 10.00. A 10 buffer is 10.06 at 20 degrees. The values change, again, depending on temperature. Let your meter automatically calibrate to the right value at that temperature. If you're not doing it automatically, make sure to look at the back of the bottle, a buffer, and calibrate to the value of that buffer at that temperature. Otherwise, you're introducing quite a bit of error, again, especially uh, with the pH of 10. 
<coughs> so you can compensate for the effect that temperature has on the electrode by getting a good electrode. You can compensate for the effect temperature has on the calibration by plugging in a temperature compensator. <coughs> you can compensate for the effect temperature has on your buffer by using the right value for calibration. What you cannot do is to adjust the effect that temperature has on your, on your sample. So all you can do is to get an accurate pH at whatever temperature your water's at. But that pH will change as the temperature changes. So if you have a water sample at room temperature, let's say the pH is 7.5, at 10 degrees C, it's going to have a different pH. Both pHs will be right for that temperature. So always, when you're writing down the pH, write down the pH and the temperature, because for that sample, it's going to change. As temperature changes, so does the pH. So always keep that in mind. When you're temperature compensating, you're not correcting the 25. You're not normalizing the reading. All you're getting is the right pH value for that temperature. This is the biggest, uh, I guess, error that I see out there. People think, oh, I've got a temperature pro plugged in. I'm getting all my readings compensated. No, uh, you're getting the right pH for that temperature. If your water's cold one day and it's a little bit warmer the next day, you should have two different pH readings. So carrot maintenance for your electrode, how do you store an electrode? Whatever you do, don't store your first electrode in water. Water's the, the worst thing you can do to store your electrode. Tap water, deionized water, distilled water. Um, the water, because what's inside an electrode is very high in salt, um, the water just sucks the ions out of the electrode and really shortens the life. So never store it in water, always store it in um, an electrode storage solution or a pH seven buffer that has salt added to it half a gram of KCL for every 100 mils of buffer, or even just a pH buffer is better. Never store just in water. If you're not going to use your electrode for a few weeks, I'll put the cap that came on that electrode back onto the electrode and put a few drops of uh, storage solution in there and kind of keep it uh, stored a little bit dry. Um, the electrode doesn't know that you're um, storing it in a liquid, in a storage solution versus a sample. So if you're storing it wet, it, it's conditioned, it's ready to go, but the life on that electrode is, is ticking. So if you want to sort of prolong the life, if you don't do a lot of samples, um, then you can store it with that cap back on if you're not going to use it in a few weeks. Um, as far as cleaning the electrode, um, the idea is to use a cleaner that's going to take what, what's on the electrode off of the electrode. And the most common one is hydrochloric acid. 0.1 normal hydrochloric acid. You can get different cleaners. You can get detergent-based cleaners. You can get alcohol-based cleaners. You can get um, bleach-based cleaners to disinfect. But the hydrochloric acid is uh, probably the, the most common one and works uh, very well. Um, so you can buy cleaning solutions or you can make up your own. Um, the idea is to um, clean the electrode um, often enough so that it has an effect. If you wait months and months and months and months and try to clean your electrode, it's probably not going to work as well as if you keep on top of uh, cleaning it. So when you need to clean the electrode, again, keep track of that slope. That's the single best indicator on um, when you need to clean the electrode. The ideal range, as I mentioned before, was 95 to 102. The cleaning range for the electrode is 92 to 95. So as it drops below 95, clean that electrode. Um, if it drops below 92, it's time to get a new electrode because you start to pick up enough air that your readings are not going to be accurate. So 95 to 102 is the ideal range, 92 to 95 is the cleaning range. Um, check the response time. A pH electrode, if it's working well, should stabilize within 30 seconds in your pH buffer. If that electrode sitting in the buffer is taking minutes to stabilize or if it's drift, drifting in the buffer, that's a problem or something wrong with that electrode. <coughs> the other check you can do is to calibrate with your electrode Go back and check your buffers. So let's say you calibrate with a 7 and a 10. Go back and check your 7. Is it reading within 0 0.01, 0 0.02? Go back and check your 10. Is it reading within 0 0.01, 0 0.02? Um, if it is, then it's good. If it overshoots or it doesn't quite get there or if it's drifting, that's a problem with the, uh, the electrode. So speed of response, check the precision, and check the slope. Those are really the things to look for um, in terms of cleaning the electrode or in terms of replacing the electrode. So how do you uh, clean the electrode? To clean the bulb, you want to soak it in the cleaning solution. So that hydrochloric acid that we talked about, soak it in that uh, solution for half an hour. After you do that, you want to replace the fill solution 
and then you want to soak it in the storage solution for at least a couple of hours. It's a great way to clean the bulb of a, a pH electrode. Um, the way to clean the junction, that ceramic or that wick junction, if you have one of those electrodes, is to soak it in hot KCL, hot salt, about 70 degrees Celsius for about 15 minutes. Soak it in that, and then replace the fill solution, and then put it in storage solution for a couple of hours before you use it. If you've got a good junction on the electrode, if you hold that electrode up in the air, after about 10 minutes, you should see um, salt crystallizing at the very bottom near the bulb. That means that the KCL that's inside the electrode is coming out through the junction, and you've got some flow there. So you definitely want to see that happening if it's just sitting in the air. So some um, hints to, to pH measurements. Um, as far as buffers are concerned, always use fresh buffers. Uh, buffers are pretty cheap, right? Um, take from your bottle of buffer or your liter of buffer or your, your cubitator of buffer, pour out into a beaker, calibrate in that beaker, get rid of that buffer afterwards. Don't reuse the buffer. Don't like put it in a beaker, put paracum over it, reduce it throughout the week. It's not worth it. If your buffer is not accurate, your readings are not going to be accurate. So um, always pour out fresh buffer when you calibrate. And keep in mind that buffer goes bad. Buffer bottles or containers will have an expiration date for that buffer when it's sealed. As soon as you crack that open, you're letting air into that buffer, especially carbon dioxide. A pH 10 buffer will go bad after about two months because it starts forming carbonic acid in the buffer from absorbing that CO2. So keep in mind, you know, find the right size of buffer for the frequency of your calibration. Uh, again, a 10 buffer goes bad after about two months of opening it. A pH 4 buffer, a pH 7 buffer, uh, a good six months before it starts to go bad. So always write down the date that you open your buffer and try to use it within these guidelines. Um, replace the fill solution. This is something that a lot of customers don't do. Uh, the more often you can replace that fill solution, the better. This says once a week. If you do it at least once, once a month, that would be good. Uh, it really helps to prolong the life of the electrode. If you look at your pH probe and you've got a lot of salt kind of settled to the bottom of that electrode, that's not a good thing. You're clogging that electrode from the inside out. So when you look at an electrode, there should be no crystallization on the inside. It should be just KCL. If you have like a little pack of salt at the bottom, um, you can take out the fill solution, put in the deionized water, dissolve that KCL, take that out of the electrode. You don't want to have crystals forming inside the electrode. And if you replace that full solution um, every few weeks, at least once a month, you'll prevent that from happening. You can use a small pipetter to suck out that fill solution, um, or if you hold the electrode on its side and you squirt some air in there, like from an empty uh, wash bottle, that'll force that uh, fill solution out pretty easily. So replace the fill solution, that's a really good uh, thing that you can do. And uh, make sure you use the right fill solution. Different electrodes, have different concentrations of fill solutions. So don't mix and match fill solutions from different manufacturers or from different electrodes. Use the one that came with that electrode or is recommended for that electrode. Make sure the level of the fill solution is as high as possible. Um, so think of, um, grab this pen here. Think of this as a, uh, a pH electrode and if you let the fill solution drop and drop and drop and drop to where my fingers are, and then you're putting this into a sample, and the level of the sample on the outside is higher than the fill solution on the inside, your sample is going to flow, it's going to backflow into the inside of the electrode. So always keep the fill level high, and keep it higher than the level of your sample. Um, it's one of those things, you know, people forget and whatnot, so keep that fill solution level high. Um, Another recommendation is to make sure that the fill hole is open when you're measuring. If you cover that fill hole when you're measuring, you're creating a vacuum and you're not allowing that fill solution to come out. Um, a good analogy there is a straw. I'm sure all of you have done this. You take a straw, you put it into a glass of water, you put your thumb on the end, and you pull it out. You've got all this water in the straw. When you let go, all the water flows out. Same thing. You want to make sure that that fill hole is open so that KCL can flow out of the electrode. Um, stir. We always recommend that you stir your buffers, that you stir your sample. If you're stirring, you're going to get a quicker reading, you're going to get a more stable reading. So always stir 
um, your buffers and your sample when you're calibrating and you're measuring. Um, when you get a brand new electrode especially, uh, it's been sitting on its side for a while, you put it into service, make sure there are no air bubbles inside. Uh, if you have any air bubbles inside, it can create uh, a loss of, uh, of, of contact. So shake it down like you would uh, an old thermometer. Uh, make sure you don't have any air bubbles in there when you put a new electrode into service. If you have an old stir plate that generates heat, put a piece of insulation there, a piece of styrofoam, a mouse pad, whatever, so you're not transferring heat into your sample. And then um, lighting electrodes. I would recommend you rinse your electrode, leave a few drops on there, that's fine. Or if you want to blot it, take a kid wipe and sort of blot the electrode. Don't wipe your pH electrode. If you wipe it, especially in the winter time, you create a lot of static, and that can really throw off your calibration. Um, so blotting is fine, leaving the water on there is fine. Make sure you use a kid wipe, not a Kleenex, not a paper towel. Um, that can really scratch the, uh, the electrode. So if you have a problem, um, usually it looks like a slow reading, or it looks like a noisy reading, or it looks like a drippy reading. Um, what do you do? Um, I would recommend that you start with the meter first. 98% of the time, your meters can be just fine. Meters last for years and years and years and years, but it's going to save you a lot of headaches if you start there first. Meters have a checkout procedure. I'll talk about it in a second. In about a minute, you can rule that out as a, as a problem. So start with the meter. Check your buffers. How old are your buffers? When did you open them? Have they expired? Check to make sure you have the right electrodes for what you're doing. How old is your electrode? The average life of an electrode is one to two years. If your electrode is seven years old, it's probably time to get a, get a new one. Um, and then your, your technique. We talked a lot, a lot about technique. Uh, make sure that you're using the right technique. Um, if you have a slow response from your electrode, it usually means that that bulb is coated and it usually means that by cleaning it with acid, you can get that response back up. If your electrode is noisy or drifty or not reproducible, it's usually a junction problem. And we talked about cleaning the junction with hot KCL or getting a flushable kind of electrode. Um, troubleshooting the meter. Um, most meters, I think all meters, come with a uh, shorting cap on the back where you plug in the electrode. Put that back on the meter. Uh, the little black plug right there, actually you can see it even better there. Um, put the, the um, mode of your meter into millivolts. When you short it out and you're reading millivolts, it should be zero, plus or minus a tenth or two of a millivolt. If your meter does that for you, then your meter's fine. Um, if the readings are drifting or they're outside of that range, that is probably a, a meter problem and it's time to send it in to be serviced. Uh, talked about buffers, talked about the expiration date, so I won't cover that again. Uh, for the pH side, we've talked a lot about this already. Make sure that you've got a clean electrode, and you're replacing the fill solution, you're covering the fill hole, uh, make sure you don't have any scratches on there, uh, make sure you're stirring your sample, all the things that we've been talking about. Stop on time. I'm going to stop, take a breath. Um, covered a lot of information. Again, I've got handouts here for those of you who are interested. Um, most of what I covered is um, here, is on that handout, um, in that handbook, I should say. Do you have any questions about anything that I covered?